In the last segment of The Family Man, there was a barrel found in the middle of the woods in the year of 1985. The town of Allenstown couldn't identify the victims. They couldn't explain what happened. In fact, every possible suspect would be ruled out. The two remains that were found inside of the barrel would become a complete cold case. 15 years later, in May of 2000, another detective would decide to take a look at the case. He would go back to re-canvas the area in which then he would discover a completely separate barrel. This barrel would also contain the remains of two human beings. But it would be the same song again. No suspects. No evidence. Again, it would be a cold case. We've been following the story of the family man. He was a rolling stone. A man with many aliases. We now know him as Bob Evans. The guy who was dating Denise Bowden. Who mysteriously vanished. Denise Bowden and her six-month-old Don Bowden haven't been seen since. We also know him as Curtis Kimball Mayo, the guy who was living on the Indian Reservation in a trailer park home with his five-year-old daughter Lisa, who he then fled from. The abandonment of Lisa would lead her into the state's care. It is now the early 2000s, the year is 2002 to be exact. And Curtis Kimball Mayo, also known as Bob Evans, is now going by the name of Larry Vanner. He's dating a girl. Her name is Unsoon Jun. She has now disappeared, and her family and friends cannot get in touch with her. This is the story of the family man, the Bearbrook's tragedy, part two. The police have now picked up Larry Vanner in order to question him about Unsoon Jun's whereabouts. He was asked to willingly submit fingerprints for testing, in which then he agrees. But when the tests come back, his other aliases will be revealed. All right, Larry, uh, your prints came back. Our, you know your other name, right? Curtis or Gerald or Jerry or whatever the name you're going by this week. Curtis Kimball. Curtis Kimball. Our Gerald uh, Mock, uh, what's his name? Mockerman? Mockerman, right. Ring a bell? No. no. Yeah, that's who you are, man. Police confront him with their findings and he's like, what, Curtis Kimball? Never heard of him. Honestly, questioning him was really more of a formality. Police had all of the information that they needed and arrested him right then and there. Because if nothing else, he had violated his parole, so they weren't just gonna let him walk right out of there. Once they had Curtis in custody, the detectives then headed over to the home in order to search for Unsoon. While the house wasn't immaculate by any stretch, there wasn't really anything to indicate that something violent had taken place there. What was odd though, was that there wasn't really anything to indicate that a woman even lived there. No purses, shoes, clothing, nothing that would lead someone to believe that Unsoon had been living there. They continued to search the house, but their search yielded nothing, so they moved on to the garage, where at the back, they found a crawl space. Maybe she hurt herself, and, and you're concerned about that getting out, that she's harmed herself. No, there's no truth. If you're, if you're, uh, if you're thinking, is she suicidal? Yeah, she's not. No. Uh, November of 2002, Bob Evans, aka Gerald Markerman, aka Curtis Mayo Kimball, aka Larry Vanner, would be arrested for the homicide of Unsoon June. She would be found inside of her home, buried under cat litter. When his court date was set and it was his time to stand before the judge, he would shock both the prosecution and the defense because he would stand up and plead guilty which is very rare for a homicide case. Perhaps he laid down a little too quickly. Something isn't right here. Why is this man of many names basically admitting his guilt when he has done everything to evade it? Nonetheless, after his guilty plea, he would be sentenced to life in prison and off he will go to serve the remainder of his life. Perhaps he took this guilty plea so the rest of the skeletons in the closet will remain there. Well, 
That's exactly what the detectives thought. They knew something else was going on. They just didn't know what. So they would go to digging. But what they would uncover would be unimaginable. Detective Roxanne Grunheim would not just let it go and walk away. She would begin digging, which would bring her right back to California, to that Indian reservation that he stayed on with his five-year-old daughter, Lisa. Little did anyone know that little Lisa was about to hold the key that would unlock everything. And I mean everything. DNA samples from Lisa and Curtis Kimball were compared and it turned out there was no familial link between the two of them. You are not the father. This prompted Detective Grunheide to reach out to the investigators who had handled Lisa's case and let them know that, hey, she's actually a Jane Doe. At one point, she was likely a missing person and there's probably family out there hoping and praying for her safe return. After receiving this information in 2003, the San Bernardino Sheriff's Department launched a whole new investigation into Lisa's identity and the exact circumstances surrounding her apparent abduction. Authorities contacted Lisa and filled her in on what they had learned and understandably, she was just as determined as they were to put the pieces together and figure out her true identity. Now a grown Lisa would be armed with the information that Lisa isn't even her true identity. She would set out to find who she really was. And just like every other aspect of this case, nothing would be easy. No shortcuts would be involved. In fact, it would take over a decade to find the answers to her true identity. Meanwhile, while this was going on, Larry Vanner, AKA Bob Evans, Gerald Mockerman, Curtis Mayo Kimball, and the list goes on, would pass away in prison in the year of 2010, taking all of his secrets to the grave. Lisa would now embark on a journey to find her own identity, but she would have a little help this time using modern technology. She took matters into her own hands and suggested that maybe her DNA could be submitted to like a genetic genealogy type website. And that if it was, maybe they could find some sort of familial tie to someone out there. While Lisa was trying to find her true identity, there was a mystery out there that still remained. The police would decide to exhume the coffins of the victims that were buried that were found in Bear Brooks. When the victims were buried, they were buried in a steel coffin instead of the traditional wooden, just in case they ever needed to be exhumed like they were doing then. Since they couldn't recover their identities, they could at least do DNA testing in which then they would confirm that the older adult woman was related to two of the children found in the barrels. But one of the girls that were discovered inside of the barrel was not biologically related to the adult female. Who was she? Remember Denise Bowden, who along with her six-month-old daughter Dawn Bowden vanished after Thanksgiving at their father Armand's. Well, she was last seen about 25 miles outside of Bear Brook State Park. So the police began to think maybe the family man was responsible for this. So they were looking for a link to link him to the barrels in the woods. Well, DNA testing was done against the victim and it wasn't Denise Bowden, nor was any of the females found in the barrel, her six month old daughter, Don Bowden. It was a Jane Doe a woman who along with two of her kids were buried inside of the barrel but the last child wasn't hers but guess who it belonged to the family man that's right bob evans gerald markerman curtis mayo kimball and larry fanner murdered his own daughter the four victims found inside of the barrel may not have names but at least now they have somewhat of an identity. Meanwhile, across the world, the genealogy report has now landed. Lisa, who is struggling to find out her identity, would miraculously be matched to relatives using DNA. After thousands of hours of research, she would be successfully matched to Armand. That's right, the father of Denise Bowden. You remember six-month-old Don Bowden? Well, guess what? That's Lisa. Now, knowing that Lisa's true identity 
was actually six month old Don Bowden who vanished after Thanksgiving. There's just three more to recover. And as fate would have it, it would actually happen at the hands of a librarian slash sleuth at night. Becky Heath. Becky was a librarian by day and an internet sleuth by night. She took it upon herself to spend hours every night after work scouring the internet. She took that time to read message boards of people speaking about their missing loved ones. She was looking for anyone who could possibly be looking for the Allenstown victims. And one night, she read a post that instantly gave her chills. I mean, I wasn't there, so I don't know that for sure, but it would me, so one would assume. She came across a post that she believed was it. A family that could be searching for the Barrow Girls. The post was a family in search of a woman and her two children whose ages, last known location, and last confirmed dates alive could 100% correspond with the Allenstown victims. She reached out to the person who made the post, they began talking, and then the woman on the other end of the conversation dropped a bomb on Becky. Last time I saw her, she was with a man. I think his last name was, any guesses? Rasmussen. Out of all of the aliases that you have heard from the family man, none of them were his real name. The real identity of the culprit is Terry Peter Rasmussen. And you are now about to find out his link to the barrels that were found inside of the woods. With this information, as well as a new form of DNA testing, three of the four Bear Brook State Park girls were positively identified as Marlise Honeychurch and her daughters Marie Vaughn and Sarah McWaters. Marlise was born on January 28th, 1954 in Stanford, Connecticut, and is described by her family as bubbly and fun with a great sense of humor. She gave birth to Marie in 1971 and Sarah in 1977, and she loved those girls and she loved being a mother more than anything. She and her husband divorced when she was in her early 20s, and unfortunately, this is when she met Terry Rasmussen. Marlise was last definitively seen alive on Thanksgiving 1978. She brought Terry to Thanksgiving at her mother's house, and as most parents meeting this man seems to go, it did not go well. Marlise and her mother got into a very heated argument, likely about Terry being gross, which ended with Marlise gathering up her children and storming out of the house with Terry. And her family never heard from her again. Now, if you've heard this story before, normally this is where the story concludes, but not for us. There's undoubtedly more to the story. You see, the property in which the barrels were found on belonged to a man named Ed Gallagher. Until now, his face has never been seen publicly. Only those who known him and spoke to him personally has ever seen his face. But I managed to uncover his photograph. There are a lot of rumors out there that possibly Terry Peter Rasmussen had a little help in what he was doing. And after the research that I've done, I would say that it's very feasible. Ed Gallagher had actually owned a store on that property before it burned down. But what's funny about this is, during the course of the investigation of investigating Terry Peter Rasmussen and his connection to the barrels, Ed Gallagher was a must go to. When they managed to track down his address and question him about the barrels, he would blurt out, don't talk to me, you need to talk to Bob Evans. And this was before he was ever even linked to the barrels. You see, while Terry Peter Rasmussen was going by the name of Bob Evans, he had a relationship with Ed Gallagher. Though he did own the property in Allenstown where the store once remained, he stayed about 40 minutes away in a town called Portsmouth. Now what I'm about to say next is nothing more than theory mixed with a little truth. You see, the town of Portsmouth also had a series of murders that went unsolved. We all know the saying that birds of a feather flock together. And in the place that Ed Gallagher was staying in Portsmouth, women were also being murdered. On October 19th of 1982, Tammy Little was found murdered in her apartment on Maplewood Avenue in Portsmouth. The manner of death would be blunt force trauma. Just one year prior to that, Laura Kempton would be discovered murdered as well. Guess how she died? Blunt force trauma. So here we have two separate murders with the same M.O. as Terry Peter Rasmussen. 
only these bodies were found in the same area that Ed Gallagher was living in. So bodies are popping up in the area that Terry Peter Rasmussen lives, as well as bodies turning up in the area that Ed Gallagher lives. It is not uncommon for killers who have partners to both have the same M.O. in which both of those women died due to blunt force trauma. But in the end, there's nothing more than my theory. But there is one more theory that I have. When Bob Evans took six-month-old Don Bowden and named her Lisa, the question that is always asked is why did he keep her alive? After all, he did murder his own flesh and blood. So if he kept Lisa alive, what if I told you that it's a possibility that Denise Bowden was also alive? There are actually a couple of things that prompted this theory. While doing my research on Ed Gallagher, running his background, looking into his history, I ran across his wife's profile. His wife's name is Kathleen Gallagher. Upon more research, I found out that Kathleen Gallagher is basically a ghost because before Ed Gallagher, you can find nothing about her history, no records, no birth certificates, not even a marriage certificate. Knowing this information, I continued to dig until I recovered the photographs of her younger years. And while analyzing the photograph, I noticed that she looks similar to someone else. In fact, she looks just like Denise Bowden. But as they say, it could be a mere coincidence. But knowing the fact that Bob Evans actually kept Lisa alive, it's highly feasible that Denise would be alive as well. In fact, the body of Denise Bowden was never recovered, never even came close to it. Maybe she was still alive. There was always rumors that Edward Gallagher and Terry Peter Rasmussen were somehow involved in trafficking. And we all know that they brainwashed the women to get them to stay. But theories are just theories, right? Could Kathleen Gallagher actually be Denise Bowden? Well, it's feasible. I mean, they never recovered her body. But again, it's just my theory. But there is one person who does need help. Terry Peter Rasmussen's biological daughter who was found inside of the barrel has never been identified. Her case is still cold. They never found her identity. They don't even know who her mother is or if she's even alive. If you have any information in regards to this case, make sure you contact the authorities. Let's help her recover her identity. Out of all of the names that Terry Peter Rasmussen used, Gerald Marker, Bob Evans, Curtis Kimball Mayo, Larry Vanner, he was undoubtedly a man who took families and then discarded of them like nothing. His pattern was murder a family and then change his name. Well, a couple of those names have no bodies attached to the alias. People wonder now, were there any more victims that fell at the hands of Terry Peter Rasmussen? I would say yes. That definitely leaves the possibility of there being more victims.